you open it up and it just works you never have to worry about how did people make it work unless of course you're an engineer have you ever wondered what is behind the scenes if you take a look at any architectural diagram of a popular service you might be surprised all of that just to make sure you can like your cat video in order to figure out why and when it became so complicated we have to go a bit in the past remember the times when in order to get an app in your computer you had to download or even buy an executable file that would install an application to your computer now imagine there was a problem with your application maybe a typo maybe a bug and you need an update that fixes the problem and in order to do that you would have to go buy or download another executable file that is if you ever do that it is incredibly difficult to make people update their applications and this space absolutely did not work for the modern world where we make changes constantly and we want to move in a faster pace so what really helped at that moment is separation of the application into the client and server think about the client as a website it's not always the case mobile applications are also clients and there is a huge variety of them but this is the easiest to understand it aggregates the data in a nice pleasant way but it does not do any heavy computational job for that we have a server server lives outside of the client machine or in other words in the cloud every time you open your browser it gets the data from the server where it is stored in the database and processed by the server itself. So the communication in a very simple way looks like this. There is a request and there is a response. And that configuration works great, except before your computer was processing only one application and now all that processing power is moved to the server but server has to give the information for a lot of clients it can handle one user it can handle five but will it handle a hundred a thousand maybe million which is a normal number for nowadays applications well probably not now if you're an engineer I have no idea why you're watching this video but you can already see a number of problems that's happening here first of all an essential part of the server is a database where we store the data when you upload your picture on a website or an app it is stored in some kind of storage and if the storage is linked directly to the server and we multiply the number of servers we have multiple storages and this is a problem because we don't know which database to trust anymore maybe you uploaded your picture on this database or maybe it went to this database so it is quite obvious that the database has to be separated and one database can become a source of truth so now these servers do not have a database the database is separate and when you make a request to the server it also makes a request to the database you can think about database as another server whose only purpose is to serve the data now we solve the problem of the storage but we do have a more important problem to look at we need to locate the servers before we would make a request to instagram.com and it would result in an ip address which is a network address of this particular server now we have two of them so which one is supposed to serve the request in order to solve this problem we're gonna get some kind of service discovery you can think about service discovery as it is an address book which links instagram.com to a list of addresses that can be resolved and that gets us to the server but what if it resolves two addresses but we always keep picking the first one then this server will be overwhelmed and it will die very quickly so how do we solve that problem well, in order to do that, we can add a load balancer. And it's getting quite messy, so let me start over. Service discovery and load balancer can be the same tool. Sometimes they are different tools, but they do have a different purpose. Service discovery helps you to locate the servers in the network, but the load balancer decides which one of them will get the load. There are several multiple techniques to do that, but the simplest of them is round robin. If the first request goes to the first server, then the second request goes to the second server. It's a very intuitively simple solution. This is not a bad setup and it can work up to some level of users. And after that, it will be just too many requests per server. So what do we do? We can always just add another server. Since the database is a separate component, our servers are stateless, which means that adding or removing another server into the system will not change the behavior. 
but adding a server is quite expensive so we want to be very mindful about increasing the number of instances how we call them and there is another solution imagine you're a news website and something happened that attracts a lot of people so 90 percent of your traffic or requests goes to one particular article you don't want to use the server computational power to get it from the database process it and return back to the client you want to store it way closer and this is where caching comes into play keep in mind that this is the very simplified diagram and in reality cache can also be distributed and thus require service discovery and load balancer in fact it is actually quite common to have a few layers of that but i think we're covering enough difficulty as is cache is kind of a simplified version of your storage so if some data is highly requested and it does not change often it's way nicer to put it in front of the whole structure instead of going through it all over again this will free up a lot of server power and customers will get their responses faster now it is a perfect architecture right almost the problem with current application is that they tend to become very huge very fast and here we've been dealing with the servers as if the whole application is one server only just think about huge companies like google their infrastructure is enormous they physically cannot put all of it into one server or think about a company where thousands of people are working on different features when they make a change you, they need to make it public which means they need to release a new version on all of their servers and if there are thousands of people working in your company then you would have to change your servers every second which is just not visible because you also have to serve your clients and then the solution would be to change the architecture of your server and the most popular one is to use microservices Despite having that name, microservices are not necessarily a micro versions of an initial server. They're just small applications with one particular goal that work well together to achieve a much bigger goal. For example, for an online store, you can have a microservice for payments or a microservice for sending emails or a microservice for processing orders. The traditional way of building microservices is having a database dedicated to a specific set of microservices, which means that another set of microservices will probably have their own database. Now, when payment team makes changes to their microservices, we don't have to re-release the whole zoo of servers. We only have to release this little part. If you need to get the data from this database from another service, you simply go through the dedicated microservice. Well, this structure would solve every problem possible, right? And again, things are a little bit more complicated. Imagine that you made a payment and this request goes into the server. Now a server has to wait for a payment to be processed in order to send an email that the payment was completed. The problem is this is completely unnecessary. What a person wants is to see a screen that the payment is accepted and they have to wait for an email. There is no need to freeze other activities on the server while we're waiting for the response from the external payment system. And we can solve this problem using asynchronous operations. There are a few ways to tackle it, and one of them would be queues. So instead of directly talking to the server, we're gonna put events into the queues. So one microservice will put an event into the queue, and another service will read from the queue. The queue does exactly what you think it does. It queues the events to be processed by a different server. Now the whole request looks like this. You make your order and you make your payment. It goes to the order service. Order service puts the payment information into the queue and gets back to you with the, hi, we're processing, just wait for the email. Meanwhile, the other server can take the payment information from the queue and check if it's completed or not. And when it is completed, it can put it in another queue that will be consumed by another server, which will send an email that the payment was successful. Or maybe the payment server will put it in the failed request queue. And in that case, a completely different email will be sent. This works quite well, except when you remove an event from the queue, it disappears. But in some cases, one event can be processed by multiple servers. For example, when the payment is confirmed, it's not only 
interesting for the email service but it's also interesting for the warehouse service so they can start processing the order and in that case instead of using a queue we're using what is called a publisher subscriber model which means that this server will be a publisher it's going to publish an event called payment successful and then other services can read this event and act on it. So both email service and a warehouse service can get this event independently from each other. And you would think that this looks fairly complex, right? But in reality, this is just the tip of the iceberg, something that is extremely simplified. Because in reality, it's not just cash, it's a distributed cash, which means that there are multiple cash instances that we have to somehow keep up to date with the actual database. Very often it's not just cash, it's also a content distribution network. And this is, by the way, how you watch your Australian videos from Europe without a huge lag. There isn't just a database, there are also multiple clients. We can have a key value database or a graph database, or a NoSQL database, or a document database, or multiple other kinds. And even with all of that, we only looked at the happy path scenario, which means that we are assuming that there are no faults in the network, every server just works as expected, and everything is going perfectly. But in reality, it almost never works like this. In reality, we have problems. Servers die, requests die, <laughs> queues die. Everything you see will die, maybe because of software issues or because of the hardware issues. And in that case, the most important thing we can add is observability. It's the way to understand which part of the system caused a problem because believe it or not, sometimes it's very difficult to find. Observability system can consist of logs, traces, metrics, graphs, alerts. This is like the whole additional world. When we design a system, we talk about a lot of things, including fault tolerance, resilience, time to recover, and multiple other concepts that make sure that when you want to open your app and like your cat video, it's actually gonna happen. As you can see under the hood, modern applications are quite complex. So as you can see to solve very real, very existing problems, we introduced new components that brought very real and very existing new problems. And now it's just complicated. There are multiple tools that are trying to solve existing problems. For example, some of the tools you see are gathered into one tool like Kubernetes. Let me know if you like this video and subscribe to the channel to see more explanations of complex software concepts for non-engineers. And I'll see you in the next one.